Hello guys, this is the Edexcel A-Level Further Maths Paper 1, which covers the Core Pure Maths section, and this is from the sample papers, so let's get straight into it. Question 1, we have to prove that the sum of 1 over r plus 1, lots of r plus 3, from r equals 1 to r equals n is equal to n lots of a n plus b over 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 where a and b are constants to be found. Well, if we split the 1 over r plus 1 lots of r plus 3 into partial fractions, we can then use the method of differences to find out this sum from r equals 1 to r equals n. So, we have 1 over r plus 1, lots of r plus 3, and this will be equivalent to a over r plus 1 plus b over r plus 3. Now, if we multiply through by r plus 1, lots of r plus 3, we have 1 equals a lots of r plus 3 plus b lots of r plus 1. We can find out the values of a and b by substituting values of r into the brackets such that the brackets will eliminate. So, for example, when r is equal to minus 1, we have over here 1 on the left hand side and on the right hand side, the b term disappears, we are left with a lots of minus 1 plus 3. So 1 is equal to 2a, a is equal to 1 half. When r is equal to minus 3, We have 1 equals, a term disappears on the right hand side, we are left with b lots of minus 3 plus 1, okay? And working this out, we have 1 equals 2b, b is equal to minus 1 half, okay? So with that being said, we can therefore conclude that 1 over r plus 1, lots of r plus 3, is equivalent to 1 over 2 lots of r plus 1 minus 1 over 2 lots of r plus 3. And therefore, we are finding the sum from r equals 1 to r equals n of 1 over 2 lots of r plus 1 minus 1 over 2 lots of r plus 3. Okay? So, with that being said, we can now substitute in values from r equals 1 to r equals n. So what we have over here then is r1 plus r2 plus r3 plus r4 plus r5 plus r6 etc. And if we write down the last three terms, we have r equals n minus 2 for the, the third term to the last term. The second to last term would be r equals n minus 1, and the final term would be r equals n. And all we have to do is simply substitute in into the formula to find out what the sum is. Okay, so with that being said, when r equals 1, we have 1 over 
2 times by 2 minus 1 over 2 times by 4. Okay. So this is our first term. Our next term, r equals 2. We have 1 over 2 times by 3 minus 1 over 2 times by 5. Our next term, r equals 3. We have 1 over 2 times by 4 minus 1 over 2 times by 6. Okay. For the next one, r equals 4. We have 1 over 2 lots of 5 minus 1 over 2 times by 7. For our next term, when r is equal to 5, we have 1 over 2 times by 6 minus 1 over 2 times by 8. Our sixth term, we have 1 over 2 times by 7 minus 1 over 2 times by 9. Then we have other terms in between. And the third to last term, when r is equal to n minus 2, we have 1 over 2 lots of n minus 2 plus 1, which is 2 lots of n minus 1. And then we subtract off 1 over 2 lots of n minus 2 plus 3, which is 2 lots of n plus 1. Next, when r is equal to n minus 1, we have 1 over n minus 1 plus 1. So we have 1 over 2 lots of n minus 1 over 2 lots of n minus 1 plus 3, which is 2 lots of n plus 2. And finally, when r is equal to n, we have 1 over 2 lots of n plus 1 minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 3. And with the method of differences method, we have to see which terms cancel out. So first of all, again, let's suppose that there are nine terms and let's ignore this dot, dot, dot. You'll notice this term and this term cancels. You'll notice this term and this term cancels. You'll notice this term and this term cancels. Okay. And you'll notice this term and this term cancels. Now, this term, the minus 1 over 2 times by 8, and the 1 over 2 lots of n minus 1 would cancel. Because remember, if n is equal to 9, then we have over here 1 over 2 lots of 9 minus 1, which is the same as 1 over 2 times by 8. So if we cross that out in a different colour, this term and this term would cancel out. In a similar way, this term, so let's just grab a different colour, and this 1 over 2n would cancel, because remember if n is equal to 9, we have 1 over 2 times by 9, so this term and this term would cancel. And you will also notice that the minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 1 and the 1 over 2 lots of n plus 1 would cancel. From this we can therefore conclude that the result of all this we have 1 over 2 times by 2 
and then we have 1 over 2 times by 3 then we have minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 2 minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 3 and our goal is to simplify all this and end up somehow with this so 1 over 2 times by 2 that's a quarter and then we add on 1 over 6 we end up with 5 over 12 so we have 5 over 12 minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 2 minus 1 over 2 lots of n plus 3 and we can write these terms with a common denominator first of all by changing this to at the bottom into a number 12 at the bottom so with that being said we have 5 over 12 minus 6 over 12 lots of n plus 2 which is the same as 1 over 2 lots of n plus 2 and then we subtract off 6 over 12 lots of n plus 3 and combining these fractions as a common denominator we have 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 we have 5 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 minus 6 lots of n plus 3 minus 6 lots of n plus 2 so now simplifying all this on the top we have 5 lots of n squared plus 5n plus 6 minus 6 times by n that's minus 6n then we have minus 18 and then we have minus 6n minus 12 okay and on the bottom we still have this 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 okay so we have 5n squared plus 25n plus 30 minus 6n minus 18 minus 6n minus 12 on the bottom we have 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 happily for us we see on the top we see that we have 5n squared plus 13n and on the bottom we have 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 and if we factorize out an n we have 5 lots of 5n plus 13 on the top and on the bottom we have 12 lots of n plus 2 lots of n plus 3 from which we see the value of a that would be 5 the value of b that would be 13. Question 2. We have to prove by induction that for all positive integers n, f of n equals 2 to the power of 3n plus 1 plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2n plus 1 is divisible by 17. Well, to do this question, first of all, let's see what happens when n equals 1. When n equals 1, f of 1 is equal to 3 times by 1 plus 1 plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2 times by 1 plus 1. So if we work this out, we have 2 to the power of 3 times by 1 plus 1 
plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2 times by 1 plus 1 you'd see we end up with the result of 391 and 391 if we divide this by 17 that's 23 so 391 that's the same as 23 times by 17 and therefore we can conclude over here that the statement is true for n equals 1 okay and with that being said our next step in a proof by induction question is to assume that the statement is true for n equals k. So we will now assume that the statement is true for n equals k. And what we mean by that is f of k equals 2 to the power of 3k plus 1 plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2 times 2k plus 1. This result over here is divisible by 17. Okay. And now with our induction step, we simply replace n with k plus 1. So for our induction step, f of k plus 1 will equal 2 to the power of 3 lots of k plus 1 plus 1 plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2 lots of k plus 1 plus 1. Okay. And Instead, let's put this in square brackets for clarity. Okay, might make life a bit easier for ourselves. So with that being said, if we simplify this, essentially, when we simplify all this, we want to end up with something that looks like this. In other words, we want to have a result where we have 2 to the power of 3k plus 1 plus 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. Of course, the numbers in front of those terms might be a bit different. So, with that being said, on the top, we have 2 to the power of 3k plus 3 plus 1. And here, we have 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 2 plus 1. And all this we can simplify. Indeed, we do see over here that we have 2 to the power of 3k plus 1. And then we still have 2 to the power of 1. And here, indeed, we do get... 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. But we still have 5 to the power of 2. Okay. So with that being said, simplifying further, sorry, here we have 3. Simplifying further, we have 8 lots of 2 to the power of 3k plus 1 plus 3 lots of 25 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. Okay. And now we need to find the difference between f of k plus 1 and f of k. And then if we can somehow show that f of k plus 1 is divisible by 17 
then of course the statement would be true. So, we now need to find the difference between f of k plus 1 and f of k. f of k plus 1, we've just found this to be 8 lots of 2 to the power of 3k plus 1 plus 3 lots of 25 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. And f of k, that was 2 to the power of 3k plus 1, plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. So we subtract off 2 to the power of 3k plus 1, plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. And with that being said, What we can now do is simplify all this. 8 lots of 2 to the power of something minus 2 to the power of this 3k plus 1. We have 7 lots of 2 to the power of 3k plus 1. And we have 3 lots of 25 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1 minus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. We end up with 24 lots of 3 to the power, uh, sorry, lots of 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. And if we pay particular attention to what we want to show, we want to show that this thing is divisible by 17. So this 24, we can rewrite as 17 plus 3. In other words, we have 7 times by 2 to the power of 3k plus 1, and 24 times by 3 times by 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. We can rewrite that as 17 times by 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1 plus 7 times by 3 to the lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. So essentially, you'll notice 17 and the 7 gives the 24. And with that being said, we can factorise out a 7 from this term and this term over here. So we have 7 lots of 2 to the power of 3k plus 1 plus 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. And then we still have this 17 times by 3 times by 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. And you'll notice over here, this bit over here is what f of x is. So is what f of k is. And we already know that this result is divisible by 17. So we have 7 lots of f of k plus 17 times by 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. Okay, and therefore we can conclude f of k plus 1 is equal to f of k so all I'm doing is I'm taking this f of k to the right hand side. So we have f of k plus this 7 lots of f of k plus 17 times by 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1. Okay, 
f of k plus 7f of k, that's 8f of k. And then we have 17 times by 3, lots of 5, to the power of 2k plus 1. And we know that f of k is divisible by 17. And then, therefore, 8 lots of this will be divisible by 17. And because 3 lots of 5 to the power of 2k plus 1 times by 17 is a multiple of 17, this bit over here is divisible by 17. We already know this bit's divisible by 17, and therefore this entire thing is divisible by 17. So let's just put that into words. We see, therefore, in conclusion, that if this statement is true for n equals k, then it has been shown true for n equals k plus 1. And as it is true for n equals 1, this statement is true for n being a positive integer. So all that is in words over here. Question 3. f of z is equal to z to the power of 4 plus a z cubed plus 6 z squared plus b z plus 65, where a and b are real constants, given that z equals 3 plus 2i is a root of the equation f of z equals 0, we have to show that the roots of f of z equals 0 on a single argand diagram. Well, the first thing that we can say is that if z equals 3 plus 2i is a root, then it follows that z equals 3 minus 2i is also a root. And therefore, what we can do then is we can form a quadratic factor. So we can form a quadratic factor And that would be of the form z squared plus v z plus w, where v and w are constants. Now, we can use the sum of the roots to find v, and we can use the product of the roots to find w. So, the sum of the roots we have 3 plus 2i plus 3 minus 2i. 3 plus 3, that would be 6. And because the sum of the roots is 6, v is equal to minus 6. Okay? And the product of the roots, that will equal... 3 plus 2i, lots of 3 minus 2i. 3 times by 3, that would be 9. And then 2i times by minus 2i, that would be minus 4i. Remember, sorry, that would be minus 4i squared. So let's just write this out. We have 9 minus 4i squared. i squared, that would be minus 1. So we have 9 lots of 4 times by minus 1, which is 13. W is equal to 13. And therefore, because we know what V and W are, we can therefore conclude Z squared minus 6Z plus 13 is a quadratic factor. Okay. Now, what does that mean? 
it means therefore that this z to the 4 plus az cubed plus 6z squared plus bz plus 65 this will be equivalent to our quadratic factor z squared minus 6z plus 13 lots of z squared and then here we have plus a z plus b where a and b are integers to be found and we can find these integers by comparing coefficients so let's write that down now comparing coefficients what we have therefore over here if we compare the numbers on the left hand side we'll see that we have 65 of them and on the right hand side we have 13 lots of b of them so we have 65 equals 13 b of course we can conclude over here b is equal to 5 and if we compare the terms involving a z squared you'll notice on the left hand side we have six of them and on the right hand side we have z squared times by b so we have b z squared you'll notice we have um, 13 lots of z squared and you'll notice we have minus 6z times by a z so we have minus 6a and with that being said knowing the value of b we have 6 equals 5 plus 13 minus 6a 6a is equal to 12 x sorry a is equal to 2 and with that being said we can conclude f of z which of course is z to the 4 plus a z squared plus 6 z sorry a z cubed plus 6 z squared plus b z plus 65 this is equivalent to z squared minus 6 z plus 13 lots of z squared um, plus 2 z plus 5 okay and with that being said working out f of z equals 0 we would therefore have over here if i just underline this we have this bit the z squared minus 6z plus 13 lots of z squared plus 2z plus 5 equaling 0 we found over here the roots were 3 plus minus 2i and if we use our calculator we can find out the roots for the other bit so if we go to an equation we have a polynomial of degree 2 with coefficients 1 um, 2 and 5 so we have minus 1 plus 2i minus 1 minus 2i so we have z equals minus 1 plus minus 2i and if we draw this on an argon diagram we have the following so 3 plus minus 2i that if we draw that we have 3 plus 2i so 3 across and 2 up that would belong somewhere here and then 2 down that would belong somewhere here so let's just join these up with arrows 
we have the coordinates 3, 2 here, and we have the coordinates of minus uh, of uh, 3 minus 2 here. And similarly, we have minus 1 plus 2i here, and minus 1 minus 2i here. So let's join these up. So we have minus 1 minus 2, and here we have minus 1 2. Okay? Question 4. We've got this curve C shown in figure 1, and this curve has a polar equation r equals 4 plus cos 2 theta, where theta is in between 0 and pi over 2. And at the point A on C, the value of r is equal to 9 over 2. The point N lies on the initial line and an is perpendicular to the initial line. The finite region r shown shaded in figure 1 is bounded by the curve c, the initial line and the line an. We have to find the exact area of the shaded region r giving your answer in the form p pi plus q root 3 where p and q are rational numbers to be found. Now, the first thing we can do, we can find out the value of theta. Theta being this bit over here. So, to do that, we can first of all equate r to 9 over 2. So, we have 4 plus cos 2 theta equals 9 over 2, from which we see cos 2 theta is equal to 1 half, because 9 over 2 take away 4, that's 1 half. So 2 theta is equal to the inverse cos of a half, which is pi over 3, and therefore theta is equal to pi over 6. So let's write this down we have pi over 6. Okay? That's the first thing. And knowing that theta is equal to pi over 6, to integrate under the curve up to the point A, we would have to use the formula of the integral equals r squared d theta from alpha to beta, where alpha here is equal to 0, beta is equal to pi over 6. Okay? Uh, sorry, we have a half, lots of this. Okay? And with that being said, we have a half lots of the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of r squared. So we have 4 plus cos 2 theta squared d theta. And this, of course, is equivalent to the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of 16 plus 8 cos 2 theta plus cos squared 2 theta d theta. And if we go to the formula book, now underneath the regular A-level math section, the formula for trigonometry, using the trigonometric identities formula, if we use over here, the formula for cos a plus minus b equals cos a 
cos b minus plus sine a sine b. If a is equal to b, we can say that cos of 2a equals cos squared a minus sine squared a. Okay? And if we replace sine squared a with 1 minus cos squared a, we have cos squared a minus 1 minus cos squared a, which simplifies to 2 cos squared a minus 1. And therefore, we can conclude over here that cos squared a is equal to cos 2a over 2 plus 1 half. And with that being said, a over here is equal to 2 theta, and therefore this bit only is the same as cos 4 theta over 2 plus a half. So, simplifying this, the integral is equal to a half lots of the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of 16 plus 8 cos 2 theta, okay, and then cos squared 2 theta, that would be a half cos 4 theta, and then we add on another half. Okay, and that bit we just worked out. And we integrate this with respect to t, with respect to theta. So, we have one half, lots of, integrating 16, we end up with 16 theta. Integrating 8 cos 2 theta, remember we div divide by the, the differential of 2 theta, which is 2. So we have 8 over 2, which is 4. So we have 4 sine 2 theta. And then integrating a half cos 4 theta, we end up with 1 eighth. So let's write this out in full. We have sine of 4 theta over 8. And then integrating a half, we end up with theta over 2. We wish to work this out in between the limit 0 to pi over 6. So, simplifying all this, we have a half, and then for our upper limit, we have 16 lots of pi over 6 plus 4 sine of 2 times by pi over 6 plus sine of 4 times by pi over 6 over 8 and then when we substitute in 0 for theta here we have 0, here we have 0 here we have 0 and here we have 0 so if we simplify this, if we work out all this bit, we have 16 times by pi, dividing that by 6 and then dividing that result by 2, we have 11 pi over 8. And over here, if we work this out, so let's just make sure we're in radians, we have 4 sine of 2 times by pi over 6 and then we have 1 eighth of sine of 4 times by pi over 6 
Okay. We end up with 33 root 3 over 16, and then multiplying that by a half, we have 33 root 3 over 6 uh, over 32. Okay, because remember 16 multiplied by the 2 gives the 32 on the bottom. Okay, so with that being said, that's the area under the curve to the point A. And now we can find out the area of the triangle using a half times by base times by height. Before we do that, we need to convert into a Cartesian form to find out the um, to find out the sort of x and y coordinates. So with that being said, we know that here we have 9 over 2, so let us add this to a diagram. And here we have um, 9 times by um, the cosine of pi over 6 over 2. And here we have 9 sine of Sorry, um, we have, if I simplify, we have over here 9 sine of pi over 6 over 2, okay? And therefore, we can easily work out the area of the triangle. So, with that being said, the area of the triangle is equal to a half times by the base, which is 9 cos of pi over 6. Stretch so pi over 6 over 2. And then we have 9 sine of pi over 6 over 2. So, working this out, we have 9 times by 9, which is 8 to 1. 2 times by 2, which is 4 times that by this 2, that would be 8. And then cos of pi over 6 times by sine of pi over 6, and then multiplying that by 81 over 8, we end up with 81 root 3 over 32. So with that being said, we can quite easily work out the area of R, which is the area underneath the curve minus the area of the triangle. So therefore, the area of R, that would be 11 pi over 8 plus 32 lots of root 3 over 32 minus 81 root 3 over 32. I'm working this out. Simplifying all this, we end up with 11 pi over 8 and 32 root 3 over 32 minus 81 root 3 over 32. That would simplify to minus 3 root 3 over 32. P is equal to 11 over 8. Q is equal to minus 3 over 2. Okay? Question 5. A pond initially contains a thousand litres of unpolluted water. The pond is leaking at a constant rate of 20 litres per day. It is suspected that contaminated water flows into the pond at a constant rate of 25 litres per day and that the contaminated water contains 2 grams of, polluted, of pollutant in every litre of water. It is assumed that the pollutant instantly dissolves throughout the pond upon entry, and given that there are x grams of the pollutant in the pond after t days, we have to show for part a that the situation can be modelled by the differential equation dx over dt equals 50 minus 4x over 200 plus t. 
Well, first of all, if water goes into the pond at 25 litres per day and leaves at a rate of 20 litres per day, the net flow into the pond will be 25 minus 20, which is 5. So therefore, the net flow into the pond, and the reason it's into the pond is because we have more water coming in than going out. The net flow into the pond will equal 25 minus 20, which is 5 litres. And therefore, if initially we have a thousand litres of unpolluted water, the amount of liquid we have in the pond after a certain number of days, remember this net flow into the pond is 5 litres per day. After a certain number of days, say two days, we can therefore say that the pond contains a thousand, which is the initial amount of water in the pond, plus 5t. Okay, so the pond contains this many litres after t days. So hopefully that makes sense. And if over here this x represents the amount of um, of pollutant in the pond after two days. So if x is the amount of pollutant in the pond after two days, okay, then we can say then that the rate of pollutant into the pond, so let's just write this down, the rate of pollutant into the pond, this will equal, if we go back to the question, we see that the rate of pollutant going in, the pollutant, well, the contaminated water contains two grams of pollutant for every litre of water. We have 25 litres going in, so therefore, the rate of pollutant into the pond will be 2 multiplied by the 25, which is equal to 50 grams per day. So maybe it would help if we put the units on. We have grams per day. And the reason we want grams per day is because here we have dx over dt, which represents the mass per time. And if we take a a look at the the rate of pollutant out. Of the pond. Then this will equal. Well, here we have. Twenty liters per day, where the pond is leaking. The pond is leaking at a rate of twenty liters per day. Okay, so let's just write that down. Twenty and that's litres per day, and then we have X amount of pollutant going into the pond, okay? And we multiply this by one over a thousand plus five T. And the reason for this, and this is quite difficult to understand, if we take a look at the units, this 20 over here, would represent the rate litres per day. So let's just write that down. We have litres per day. X over here is grams. And then one over this, that would be one over litres. And hopefully you can see that we end up with a unit of grams per day. So the, reason, the way we can get a unit of grams per day is to multiply by 1 over 1000 plus 5t. So my advice over there would be 
to take care of your units. So with all that being said, we can conclude dx over dt, if we simplify this bit, we will end up with 20x over 1000 plus 5t, which simplifies to 4x over 200 plus t. And our units are grams per day. Okay. So dx over dt is equal to 50 minus 4x over 200 plus t. Now for part b, we have to find the number of grams of pollutant in the pond after t days. And we can do that by solving this differential equation using the integrating factor, which I will write up right now. So for the integrating factor, we have dx over dt plus p lots of x equals q. And this has solutions e to the power of the integral of p dt multiplied by x equals the integral of e to the power of the integral of p dt multiplied by q with respect to t plus some constant c. And the integrating factor i is equal to e to the power of the integral of p with respect to t. So with that being said, we can first of all notice over here that dx over dt is equal to 50 minus 4x over 200 plus t, from which we can say, if we put this into this form over here, we have dx over dt plus 4 over 200 plus um, 5, sorry, 200 plus t multiplied by x equals 50. So with that being said, we see over here p is equal to 4 over 200 plus t. Let's just write that down. p is equal to 4 over 200 plus t. And q is equal to, as we see over here, 50. We can now find the integrating factor i, which is equal to the integral, which is equal to e to the power of the integral of p with respect to t. So i is equal to e to the power of the integral of 4 over 200 plus t dt. So if we integrate 4 over 200 plus t, that would be 4 times by the natural log of 200 plus t. So we have e to the power of the natural log of 200 plus t to the power of 4, which hopefully you can see that is the same as 200 plus t to the power of 4. And if we notice over here that 200 plus t to the power of, the f of 4 is what we have over here, then we can conclude over here that we have 200 plus t to the power of 4 multiplied by x is equal to the integral of 200 plus t to the power of 4 multiplied by 50 multiplied by dt plus some constant c. So with that being said, if we, do, if we integrate the 200 plus t to the power of 4 multiplied by 50 with respect to t, we end up with 10 lots of 200 plus t to the power of 5, because remember we add 1 to the 1, 
divide by the new power and then divide by the differential of the bracket and we do that using the reverse chain rule and then we still have this constant c okay so let's just write this out in full we have 204 multiplied by x equals this and if we take a look at our initial conditions when t is equal to zero x is equal to zero because that's when the water is clean so when t is equal to zero x is equal to zero so with that being said substituting those values in we have 200 plus zero to the power of four multiplied by zero and this is equal to 10 lots of 200 plus zero to the power of five plus c of course c is equal to minus 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 12 and therefore we have 200 plus t to the power of 4 x equals 10 lots of 200 plus t to the power of 5 minus 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 12. If we rearrange for x, we have 10 lots of 200 plus t to the power of 5 minus 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 12 over 200 plus t to the power of 4. Okay. And now if I go back to the question, we have to find the number of grams of pollutant in the pond after t days. So after t days, that's when t is equal to 8. So when t is equal to 8, we're finding x of 8. So we have 10 lots of 200 plus 8 to the power of 5 minus 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 12 over 200 plus 8 to the power of 4. So if we work this out, we have 10 lots of 200 plus 8 to the power of 5 minus 3.2 times by 10 to the power of 12 over 200 plus 8 to the power of 4. We end up with a value of 370.39 etc. Of course we have 370 grams to the nearest whole number. For part c we have to explain how the model could be refined. Well we can do various things but one of the things we could do is to model this in such a way that the the rate of leaking could be made to vary with the volume of water in the pond okay so that's question number five done, which I thought, in my opinion, was fairly easy. Question number six, f of x is equal to x plus two over x squared plus nine. You have to show that the integral of f of x with respect to x is equal to a lots of the natural log of x squared plus 9 plus b lots of the inverse tangent of x over 3 plus c where c is an arbitrary constant and a and b are constants to be found. Well to do this question for part a we have f of x which is equal to x plus 2 over x squared plus 9 and we can rewrite this as x over 
x squared plus 9 plus 2 over x squared plus 9. And we can further rewrite this as x over x squared plus 9, which we can find the integral of. And then we have two lots of 1 over x squared plus 3 squared. And the reason I write 2 over x squared plus 9 in this form, if we go to our formula book under the integration section, we have been given the integral of 1 over a squared plus x squared. That's over here. Okay. So, with that being said, we can first of all integrate, well, let's write it down actually. The integral of f of x with respect to x, that will equal the integral of x over x squared plus 9 with respect to x, plus two lots of the integral of 1 over x squared plus 3 squared with respect to x. And we can find out the integral of x over x squared plus 9 by integration by substitution. So we can consider this integral by integration by substitution. Okay. So to integrate this with, with substitution, we have a value. If we make a substitution x squared plus 9, du over dx is equal to 2x, and therefore dx is equal to 1 over 2x with respect to u. So we can say from here that the integral of x over x squared plus 9 with respect to x, we have x over u, and then dx, that was 1 over 2x, then we multiply this by du, the x's cancel, and therefore we end up with the integral of 1 over u with respect to u, which is equal to 1 over I'm um, sorry, integrating 1 over u, that would be the natural log of u. And don't forget, we still have this half. So we end up with a value of a half times by the natural log of u plus c. Okay. And knowing that u is equal to x squared plus 9, we can therefore conclude that the integral of x over x squared plus 9 with respect to x is equal to 1 half times by the natural log of x squared plus 9 plus c. And with that being said, we can also find out the integral of 1 over x squared plus 3 squared. In the formula book, we found that to be 1 over a times by the arctan of x over a. And therefore, in conclusion, the integral of f of x with respect to x is equal to a half times by the natural log of x squared plus 9 plus 2 thirds times by the arctangent of x over 3. And the reason we have 2 thirds, remember, we multiplied by 2 over here. For part b, ensure that the mean value of f of x over the interval 0 to 3 
is a sixth times by the natural log of 2 plus 1 over 18 pi. Well, the mean value is given with the following formula. So the mean value of f of x over the integral a, b is 1 over b minus a multiplied by the integral of f of x with respect to x between a and b. In other words, we have the mean value given as 1 over 3 minus 0 multiplied by the integral from 0 to 3 of f of x with respect to x. So we have a third, lots of, we've just found this integral, I mean all the limits, the integral remember we found over here. So we have a half times by the natural log of x squared plus 9, plus 2 thirds times by the arctan of x over 3 in between 0 and 3. And if we substitute in our limits, upper limit is 3, lower limit is 0, we have one third lots of, if we substitute in for our upper limit, we have a half times by the natural log of 3 squared plus 9, that would be 18. And then we have two thirds times by the inverse ton of 3 over 3, which is 1. For our lower limit, we have a half times by the natural log of 0 squared plus 9, which is 9. And we have 2 thirds times by the arc ton of 0 over 3, which is 0. So with that being said, if we work all this out, we have a third, and then if I open up a bracket, we have a half times by the natural log of 18 minus a half times by the natural log of 9. That would be a half times by the natural log of 18 over 9. And then we have two thirds of the inverse tan of 1, which is pi over 4. So, working this out, we have a third lots of a half times by the natural log of 2, because 18 over 9, that's 2. And then we have here pi over 6. Okay. And if I multiply the third into the bracket, we end up with 1 over 6 times by the natural log of 2, plus pi over 18, which is our final answer. And now for part C, we have to use our answer to part B to find the mean value of the interval 0 to 3 of f of x plus the natural log of k, where k is a positive constant, giving it answer in the form p plus 1 over 6 ln q, where p and q are constants and q is in terms of x, sorry, is in terms of k. So for part C, this is quite straightforward, we have f of x plus the natural log of k. So f of x, that would be 1 over 6 times by the natural log of 2 plus pi over 18. And then we add on the natural log of k. Okay. So if we simplify this, I can rewrite the natural log of k as 6 over 6 times the natural log of k. So we have 1 over 6 times by the natural log of 2 plus pi over 18 plus 6 over 6 times by the natural log of k. And if we factorise out a sixth, we have a sixth lots of the natural log of 2 plus 6 times by the natural log of k. We still have this pi over 18. So we have a sixth, and inside the bracket, we have the natural log of 2. And if I power slide this 6 up, we have the natural log 
of k to the power of 6. Still, we add on pi over 18. So we have a 6 lots of, if I combine these logs, we have the natural log of 2k to the power of 6, and then we add on pi over 18. And that is our final answer. Question number seven. Figure two over here shows the image of a gold pendant, which has height two centimeters. The pendant is modeled by a solid of revolution of a curve C about the y-axis. The curve C has parametric equations x equals cos theta plus a half sine two theta, and y equals minus one lots of one plus sine theta, where theta is in between zero and pi over two, uh, in between zero and two pi. We have to show for part A that the Cartesian equation of the curve C is x squared equals minus 1 lots of y to the 4 plus 2y cubed. Well, here we have a half sine 2 theta, and if we go to our formula book under the regular A-level math section, if A equals B, then we have sine 2A equals 2 sine A cos B, from which we see a half sine 2a is equal to sine a cos b. And with that being said, we can therefore say for part a, x which we know is cos theta plus a half sine 2 theta, we have cos theta plus sine theta cos theta. Okay, and if we factorise out a cos theta, we have cos theta lots of 1 plus sine theta, and 1 plus sine theta, if we take a look over here for our equation in y, we can rearrange to say that 1 plus sine theta is equal to minus y. So therefore we have cos theta lots of minus y which is minus y cos theta. And if we take a look at our equation y, we have minus 1 lots of 1 plus sine theta, which is the same as minus 1 minus sine theta. Okay, and if we think about it, we have over here sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. We can rearrange this equation and this equation and substitute into this equation here. If I call this uh, equation 1, this equation 2, and this equation 3, we can rearrange from equation 1 to say that cos theta is equal to minus x over y. And from equation 2, we can rearrange to say that sine theta is equal to minus 1 minus y. We'll call this equation 4. We'll call this equation 5. We will now substitute in equation 4 and 5 into equation 3. So if we substitute equation 4 and equation 5 into equation 3. We have minus x over y squared plus minus 1 minus y squared equals 1. And if we use algebra, we can end up at this equation here. And that's all we have to do for the rest of this question. So, we have x squared over y squared equals 1 minus minus 1 minus y squared. So we have x squared over y squared equals 1 minus minus 1 minus y minus 1 minus y. So we have x squared over y squared equals 1 minus y squared plus 2y plus 1. 
So simplifying this, we have x squared over y squared equals minus y squared minus 2y. Multiplying through by y squared, x squared is equal to minus y to the 4 minus 2y cubed. And if I factorise out a minus 1, x squared is equal to minus 1 lots of y to the 4 plus 2y cubed. For part b, hence using the model you have to find in centimetres cubed the volume of the pendant. And that's quite easy to do. If we use a volume of revolution about the y-axis, the formula for that volume is equal to pi lots of the integral from a to b of x squared with respect to y. So, we can say that the volume is equal to pi lots of the integral from minus 2 to 0 of minus 1 lots of y to the 4 plus 2y cubed dy. And if I take out a minus 1, we have minus pi lots of the integral from minus 2 to 0 of y to the 4 plus 2y cubed dy. Okay? So, if we work this out, we have minus pi lots of y to the 5 over 5. And then here we have y to the 4 over 4. And this is in between minus 2 and 0. Now substituting in, for our upper limit, we have 0 to the 5 over 5 plus 0 to the 4 over 4. For our lower limit, we have minus 2 to the power of 5 over 5 plus minus over 4. And if we work this out, we have 8 pi over 5 centimetres cubed. Question number 8. We have a line L1 which has equation x minus 2 over 4 equals y minus 4 over minus 2 equals z plus 6 over 1. The plane pi has equation x minus 2y plus z equals 6. The line L2 is the reflection of the line L1 in the plane pi. We have to find a vector equation of the line L2. Well, to do this question, it would help if we draw on what's actually going on. And I will do that right now. So I think I've drawn a pretty good diagram over here to illustrate what's going on. In black, we've got our plane pi. Let's label this. And then in blue, we have our line, well, rather in red, we have our line L1, okay? And we're finding the equation of the blue line L2, which we will also label here. And we also have the line in green here, which is the normal. Okay, the green line is the normal to the plane, so we have 90 degrees here. Okay, there's a couple of things to notice. The red line intersects the plane, L1 intersects the plane at the point A. We'll label A here. And we can find out a general point on the red line, we'll call this P, and then we can from then find the point where that intersects 
the plane, call it M, and then find this M over here is a midpoint, and we can use then the midpoint to find coordinates Q over here, and from that we can find the equation of L2. So hopefully all that makes sense. And we know that A lies on X1. Uh, sorry, we know that A lies on L1. And from that, we can figure out the coordinates of A. Okay. So if we attempt this question, the first thing we can draw, if I draw the plane pi, we'll draw an equivalent 2D diagram. If I draw the 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 plane pi in 2D, so this is pi, then we have our line L1 in red. This over here is our line L1. And We've got this point here, which lies on the point on the line L1. And we can actually find out the coordinates of that point. Okay. We can find this coordinate P, which we will do now. Now, we begin, of course, noticing that over here, we can we can say over here, knowing the equation of L1 shown here, we can find out the vector equation of L1. So let's just write this down. The, the vector equation of the line L1, this would be um, well, if we write this on the line below, we have over here, if we take a look at the equation for L1, we have minus 2, minus 4, positive 6. And if we just go to the formula book, under the A-level further math section, if we just quickly um, go to the A-level further math section, under the vectors section, which is somewhere um, bear with me, we can use this over here. Let's highlight it. If a point A is the point with position vector A i A one i plus A two j plus A three k, and the and the direction of B is given by B shown over here, then the straight line through A with direction vector B has Cartesian equation of this. So we can use that information to find out the vector equation of L1. So your A1, your A2 and your A3 are 2, 4 and minus 6 respectively and the B1, the B2 and the B3 are 4, minus 2 and 1 respectively. And therefore, the vector equation of L1 would be, um, we'll call it R, this would be 2, 4, minus 6, plus lambda, lots of 4, minus 2, 1. So all we are doing over here is using this Cartesian form to write it in vector form. And therefore, the coordinates of P shown here, the coordinates of P would be 2, 4, minus 6. And therefore, this coordinate of P is a point on L1. Okay? It's a point on L1. So let's just add this to the diagram. We have over here 
of a point P with coordinates 2, 4. OK. And this point A, where the line L1 intersects the plane, we can write a general form for the position vector of A, and then using this form over here, we can find out the value of lambda and then substitute that in back into the position vector of A to find out the coordinates of A. So we can say over here A lies, um, A, the point A lies on the line L1 and it also lies on the plane x minus 2y plus z equals 6. Remember this over here is the equation of the plane and therefore we can say over here that A has a position vector Using the form of L1, remember A lies on L1, so the general point of A would be um, 2 plus 4 mu, 4 minus 2 mu, and minus 6 plus mu. Okay, and this A, this vector over here, will satisfy um, the following. So we're looking at the point where the plane intersects the line L. And we do that by taking the dot product of the plane over here, the coefficients of the components of the plane, with the position vector of A, and we set that equal to 6. So we have over here 1, lots of 2 plus 4 mu. Then we have minus 2, lots of 4 minus 2 mu. Plus 1, lots of minus 6 plus mu. And all this is equal to 6. With this, we can find out the value of lambda and find out the coordinates of A. So we have 2 plus 4 lambda minus 8 plus 4 lambda minus 6 plus lambda equals 6. We see over here we have, if we rearrange, 9 lambda, which is equal to 18, and therefore lambda is equal to 2. From which we can conclude, if we substitute this value of lambda equals 2 into this position vector of A, we can find out the coordinates of A. So we have 2 plus 2 times by 4, remember lambda is 2, then we have 4 minus 2 times by 2, and then we have minus 6 plus 2, so the position vector of A would be 10, 0, minus 4. And with that being said, if we write this as coordinates, we have A which has coordinates 10, 0, minus 4. So let's add this on to our diagram. We have the point A here, which has coordinates 10, 0, minus 4. Okay? And if we know the equation of the plane over here, we can then say that we, we can find from here a normal vector shown in green over here. Okay? So, writing that down, 
a perpendicular a perpendicular direction vector to pi we'll call this n n would be i minus 2j plus k okay so we look at the coefficients over here of 1 minus 2 1 and therefore we can say if we go back to our diagram from this we can find out a vector of the equation of the line through p perpendicular to pi so we will now find out this vector equation of the normal and from that we can then find out the coordinates of q okay so with that being said we can then say that a vector equation of the line through p perpendicular to pi dick to pi this would be given by if I just move this up slightly this vector equation would be given by r equals 2 4 minus 6 okay now this 2 minus 4 minus 6 is here and then so so what I'm saying is the green line passes through this point P plus mu lots of 1 minus 2 1 shown here okay so with that being said if we let Q with coordinates x1 y1 and z1 be the point of intersection of this of this line l2 okay and one thing that we must also notice is that q is a reflection of the point A which has coordinates 2, 4, minus 6 with that being said we can first of all find out these, this coordinate of Q by first of all defining a midpoint but before we do that let's first of all draw on what's going on and remember we have to find this equation l2 first of all if we draw a normal to the plane shown here in green then essentially the line l2 will look something like this okay and what we have over here is the plane being perpendicular to this normal and we have the coordinates of q here which we'll find the coordinates of but before we do that we need to find this midpoint m and if we find this midpoint m we can quite easily work out the coordinates of q okay so this in blue over here is of course the line l2 which we need to find so once we found um q we can easily work out the vector equation l2 okay because we can find out the direction aq from that so over here if we go back 
we can let m be the midpoint of pq. So we will let m be the midpoint of pq. Okay. So we already know that m would lie on, if we go back over here, m would lie on this green line over here, which is the normal. So with that being said, m does indeed lie on pi over here, as shown here. So with that being said, Let's write this down. M lies on the line x minus 2y plus z equals 6. And therefore, this would satisfy um, 1 lots of 2 plus mu. Okay, so what we are doing over here is using this. So we have 1, lots of 2 plus mu. So maybe if I write this out in full, we have 2 plus mu, 4 minus 2 mu, and minus 6 plus mu. And then we have our next uh, property, minus 2, lots of 4 minus 2 mu. And then we have 1 lots of minus 6 plus mu. All this is equal to 6. So we have 2 plus mu minus 8 plus 4 mu minus 6 plus mu equals 6. Simplifying, we have 6 mu equals 18 mu is equal to 3. And therefore, from this, we can find out the position vector of m. So let's write this down. m therefore has position vector if we work this out we have 2 plus 3 times by 1 then 4 minus 3 times by 2 and then minus 6 plus 3 times by 1. If we work all this out we have 5 minus 2 minus 3. So m has coordinates 5, minus 2, minus 3. Let's add this to the diagram. m has coordinates 5, minus 2, minus 3. And from this, we can find out the coordinates of q, okay? And we can do that quite easily using the diagram. So using the diagram, Q has coordinates, if we write down the coordinates of Q, all we have to do over here is look at the diagram and think, to go from 2 to 5 we add 3, so 5 plus 3, that's 8. To go from 4 to minus 2, we subtract 6, minus 2 minus 6, that's minus 8. And to go from minus 6 to minus 3, we add 3, so minus 3 plus 3 that's zero. Okay. So the coordinates of Q would be eight minus eight zero. And what you'll notice over here is that L2 is a line through this point Q and A. And therefore, if we define the vector AQ, from that, that would be sort of our gradient. And we know that it lies at the, on the point Q. So we can find out the equation of L2. So let's write this down. L2 is a line through Q and A. So this would have direction. If we work this out, 
it would have direction AQ, so if we go back over here, everything I've just said is shown here. AQ is equal to OQ minus OA. So we have 8 minus 8, 0, that's the coordinates of Q, minus 10, 0, minus 4. So we end up with minus 2, minus 8, 4. And if I take out a minus 2 as a factor, we have minus 2 lots of 1, 4, minus 2. And with that being said, we can therefore conclude, knowing that um, the line L2 passes through A and Q, I and mean, we already know the direction AQ, we can therefore conclude that a vector equation of L2, this would be given as um, 10, 0, minus 4, plus some parameter t, lots of 1, 4, minus 2. So that's the end of this question. Quite difficult, but hopefully everything I've said and also drawn out makes complete sense. Question number nine. A company plans to build a new fairground ride. The ride will consist of a capsule that will hold passengers and the capsule will be attached to a tall tower. The capsule is to be released from rest from a point halfway up the tower and then made to oscillate in a vertical line. The vertical displacement x meters of the top of the capsule below its initial position at time t seconds is modelled by the differential equation m equal um, is modelled by the differential equation m lots of d squared x over dt squared plus four lots of dx over dt plus x equals two hundred cos t, where t is greater or equal to zero. m is the mass of the capsule, including its passengers in thousands of kilograms. The maximum permissible weight of for the capsule, including its passengers, is three is thirty thousand newtons. Taking the value of g to be ten meters per second squared, and assuming the capsule is at its maximum permissible weight, we have to explain why the value of m is equal to three. I've got this reason over here. The weight is equal to the mass times by gravity. So if we rearrange for the mass, mass over here is equal to the weight over gravity. So the weight is 30,000, gravity is 10. So we end up with the mass being 3,000. But the mass is in thousands of kilograms. And therefore, because of that, m is equal to 3. And then we have to show that a particular solution to the differential equation is x equals 40 sine t minus 20 cos t and then find a general solution of the differential equation. This will require a lot of work. So we've got our differential equation, 3 d squared x over dt squared plus 4 dx over dt plus x equals 200 cos t, where t is greater or equal to 0. We can first of all find out our auxiliary equation, and then from that we can find out our homogeneous solution. So, for our auxiliary equation, our auxiliary equation, we look at the coefficients. So we have 3, and then say a squared plus 4a plus 1 equals 0. We can factorise this as a product of two brackets. We end up with 3a plus 1, a plus 1 equals 0, from which we see a is either equal to minus 1 third or minus 1. And what we see over here is that we have 2 
distinct real solutions and therefore our homogeneous equation will be of the form p e to the minus t plus q e to the minus t over 3. And if we consider our particular integral, so for the particular integral, we have over here, if we go and have a look at the differential equation, we have on the right hand side 200 cos t. And therefore, our particular integral will be of the form um, uh, well instead actually let's change the parameters here so if we use a different letter so for our particular integral that will be of the form a cos t plus b sine t okay and the reason for that, if we have a look at the right-hand side, that involves a slight bit of trick. So with that, we can first of all find out what dx over dt is. Differentiating a cos t, we end up with minus a sine t. Differentiating b sine t, we end up with b cos t. And if we find out the second derivative, dx squared over dt squared, differentiating minus a sine t, we end up with minus a cos t, and differentiating b cos t, we end up with minus b sine t. And knowing the value of d squared x, dx and x, we can substitute these quantities into the left hand side over here. So the equation becomes so the equation becomes three lots of minus a cos t minus b sine t plus four lots of minus a sine t plus b cos t plus one lots of a cos t plus b sine t and this is equal to 200 cos t so we can now find the values of a and b by comparing coefficients so we can now find the values of a and b by comparing coefficients. So with that being said, if we take a look at the sine t's, on the left hand side we have 3 times by minus b of them, so we have minus 3b. Then we have four lots of minus a of them, so we have minus 4a, and then we have another b of them. On the right hand side, we have zero of them. So, we have minus 4a minus 2b equals zero, 2a plus b is equal to zero. We'll call this equation one. And if we have a look at the cosine of t, on the left hand side we have three lots of minus a of them. We have four lots of b of them, so we have 4b, and then we have another a of them. On the right hand side we have 200 of them. So we have minus 2a plus 4b equals 200. We'll call this equation 2. And we can now solve equation 1 and 2 simultaneously. 
So we can now solve equation 1 and equation 2 simultaneously. And doing so, adding the equations together, 5b is equal to 200, b is equal to 40, and when b is equal to 40, substituting into the first equation, so when b is equal to 40, it follows that we have 2a plus 40 equals 0, a is equal to minus 20. So we know the value of a, we know the value of b, and therefore we can substitute these values into our general particular integral form, a is equal to minus 20, b is equal to 40. We can conclude that we have the particular integral equaling 40 sine t minus 20 cos t. And therefore, our general solution will be of the form pe to the minus t plus qe to the minus t over 3 plus 40 sine t minus 20 cos t. Okay? And now for part b, we have to use the model to find to the nearest meter the vertical distance of the top of the capsule from its initial position 9 seconds after it's released. So, first of all, we can find out the values of p and q and then we want to write our particular solution. Um, so we have an equation involving t's, and then we can substitute in t equals 9 to find out the value of the vertical displacement. First of all, when t is equal to 0, x is equal to 0. So if we use this information, um, x equals 0, t equals 0. So we have pe to the 0 plus qe to the 0 plus 40 sine 0 minus 20 cos 0. All this is equal to 0. We see over here that we have um, p plus q equals 20. And also, the second derivative, which is the speed, the initial speed will also equal zero. But before we find the initial speed, we would have to differentiate this general solution. So dx general solution over dt, differentiating p e to the minus t, we end up with minus p e to the minus t, differentiating q e to the minus t over 3, we end up with minus 1 third q e to the minus t over 3. Differentiating 40 sine t, we end up with 40 cos t. Differentiating minus 20 cos t, we end up with positive 20 sine t. And the next piece of information we can write down is that when t is equal to 0, dx general solution over dt is equal to 0. So with this, substituting the values of t equals 0 into this over here and setting that equal to 0, we have minus p e to the 0 minus 1 third q e to the 0 plus 40 cos 0 plus 20 sine 0 equals 0. We see over here then, we end up with p plus a third q equals 40. We can now find out the values of p and q by solving this equation with this equation simultaneously. So we can now solve equation 3 and equation 4 
simultaneously. So, if we subtract the equations, we have p minus p, which is equal to 0p, q minus a third q, that's two thirds q, and then uh, 20 minus 40, that's minus 20. q is equal to minus 30. It follows that from here we have p plus a third lots of minus 30 equals 40, p is equal to 50. So with that being said, our solution, our particular solution, we will just leave it as x, um, our particular solution of x is equal to 50 e to the minus t minus 30 e to the minus t over 3 plus 40 sine t minus 20 cos t. Now for part b, um, so with that being said, when t is equal to 9, we can find out the value of x. So x will equal 50 e to the minus 9 minus 30 e to the minus 9 over 3 plus 40 sine of 9 minus 20 cos of 9. So working this out, if we grab our calculator, we have um, over here 50 e to the minus 9 minus 30 e to the minus 9 over 3 plus 40 sine of 9 minus 20 cos of 9. We end up with 33.219 etc. And therefore we have 33 meters. Okay, so that concludes the end of the paper. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Any questions, please feel free to comment them in the comment section below. And hopefully I'll see you on the next video.